In the white paper, Satoshi doesn't use the word blockchain anymore. In his early writings, it is referred to as a time chain. You go back one year or 10 years into the chain, these things are unchangeable. There's a time chain, there's a chain of events in time. That sequence is in consensus, it is immutable, it is authoritative. So now anyone who uses Bitcoin, anyone who runs a node or who does a transaction on chain, they are beholden to this sequence of events that they cannot change. It's a truth. It's powerful in the sense that it cannot be manipulated in the way that, you know, all other things in human world seem to be able to be manipulated. A new type of way to track these moments that pass as a global consciousness, that that's what a block height is. It's literally a particular moment in time, regardless of where you are on the planet, that we can all agree upon. Good morning, unpredictable future. Good morning, immutable past. It could take one second and somebody could find the block. It couldn't take two hours or more for somebody to find the block. And no one knows. As you learn more about Bitcoin, you are exposed to more truths. You learn truth about the legacy money system. You learn truth about banking and how really the strings of power are pulled in the world. And that could be a very painful thing for people. Why not blockchain? Why is it a time chain? Hey, well, thank you. That that's a that's a great question, and it's uh, it's something that's very meaningful to me. Um, you know, in the in the white paper, Satoshi doesn't use the word blockchain anymore. In his early writings, it is referred to as a time chain, and I feel like time is the really kind of important thread that runs through so much of what is important about Bitcoin. Um, if we look at human history, we have all these different documents uh, in different parts of the world from different cultures and societies. And, you know, today looking backward, we, we have, you know, very different uh, points of view about history and what has occurred. It's almost like the record of, of uh, importance is not a, it's not a consensus. It's something that is broken and fragmented and gets changed over time. You look at certain documents that have lived on, and it's not the original document that you're looking at. You're looking at a copy of a copy of a translation of a copy of a translation, this kind of thing. So with Bitcoin, to me, when I think of the word time chain, I think of this authoritative sequence. Those are the important words for me. It's uh, it's a record that is in consensus, and in such, it's it's immutable. It cannot be changed. You cannot go back into the history of Bitcoin transactions and change it. Now, the the caveat on that is the the very tip of the chain is being competed over, and there's times. Actually, almost every day we, we have uh, these very small uh, differences of the tip of the chain. and But that gets reconciled as more blocks get added. Uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to change uh, a block that's older, that has more blocks on top of it. You know, a lot of exchanges will require six confirmations. That's six blocks after the block with the transaction in it. Uh, and, and that's basically because of this nature of how difficult it is to change something as it becomes deeper in the chain. So you go back one year or 10 years into the chain, these things are unchangeable. So we have right there, there's a time chain. There's a chain of events in time that sequence is in consensus. It is immutable. It is authoritative. So now anyone who uses Bitcoin, anyone who runs a node or who does a transaction on chain, they are beholden to this sequence of events that they cannot change. It's a truth. It is a, it is, it's powerful in the sense that it cannot be manipulated in the way that, you know, all other things in human world seem to be able to be manipulated. Now, I feel like there's a lot of examples of revision of history that happens in our society 
people have a hard time agreeing upon things that happened just recently, you know, uh, just even a year or so ago. And uh, it, in Bitcoin, we have basically something that is just um, really a, a different kind of history that's unfolding here. And I feel like it's um, so uh, significant in human history that, that we have now a way to record something that is unchangeable and and true that's a that's a very interesting point because when we should look at what 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 all the history has been done and everything uh has been there for for the dawn of time um there's never been something that cannot really be changed by someone else like i I've, i could not figure out like i could not find any comparison to what we have now it's digital um it cannot really be destroyed like you kind of have to destroy the internet and all the planet uh and the, the whole whole earth to really destroy bitcoin because there could be in some sense anywhere like in some room a, a, a laptop that still keeps it running um so you really have to really destroy the planet Uh, if you want to destroy it, uh, which is very unlike unlikely to happen, um, what what does this mean for for us, for us as a society, as 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 the human species, um, that we now finally have something we can truly rely on? Like this, this thing will not change. Well, I I I personally believe that right now, the world that we live in is so. Uh, impacted by uh, information and so much of it is not true and people are struggling with that we have conflicts in in society uh, people don't agree about what's real uh, now we have AI we're, it's almost like we're living in a, a post-truth world and depending which news channel that you get your news from depending which social media you follow depending what you see and experience out in the world you can have a wildly different understanding of what is actually happening and so this is very very important so to me it's not that bitcoin literally solves everything but how significant is it that we have now this one thing this we can we can point to the utxo set of bitcoin And every person on the planet can see the same truth. And it's independently verifiable. And any person can go and see it themselves and know themselves that that is true. And they're seeing the same truth everyone else is seeing. Maybe this is the beginning of something new. Maybe this is the, the foundation layer on which uh, society can kind of evolve. And people can start to... Um, move forward with at least some common knowledge at least about this utxo set we can agree what is true i feel like that's that's significant that's very significant that's it's like um i made uh, a small group for my channel members just so we we can uh, talk about stuff uh, and when something happened some event happened i i don't remember what it was actually uh, but it happened the event we did it Uh, and then right afterwards, someone just said for documentation reason, for document reasons, and then uh, the the current block. So we can actually uh, then look back, oh, this was a dead block. When we spin this thought further and more and more humans actually adopt it, because right now it's like a very, very small group of people. Like when you go on the street and ask the people, what is the time chain? <laughs> I don't know how, how many people even uh, could could do something with that that term and could link it to Bitcoin. I think when you you ask people like, hey, "Is Bitcoin and time chain connected?" I think most people uh, outside of the Bitcoin sphere would would say, oh, how are they connected?" I don't know. It's it, I only know blockchain. Um, also, interesting point that Satoshi actually named the time chain in the original thing, and it's never mentioned <laughs> anything from blockchain. I never heard that, but. Uh, uh it's 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 interesting that he have an action never do that but when we stay at this thought and we spin that uh further is it possible uh or how do you imagine that that it's possible that we 
only have Bitcoin as a measurement even of time, like is a measurement of events, uh, as a measure uh, as a measurement of like, oh let's let's uh meet at that and that block. Uh do do you think that's possible or or how can it be possible? Yeah, I, I mean this is where it gets really interesting because uh we actually have this experience within Bitcoin, within the the population that pays attention to Bitcoin. You know, we just had a we just had a having. We had the the fourth having entering Epoch Five. That was back in April. It was on the twentieth of April or the nineteenth of April, depending which time zone you're in. But everyone who was paying attention to this was very closely watching the block height and waiting for block eight hundred and forty thousand. And that moment was experienced by everyone across the globe at the same time. So there's something very powerful about a block time, the the actual timestamp and the block height of a specific block is actually a very unique way to experience time as a global human race, right? A lot of things that we put meaning in get experienced in sort of waves across time zones. Think of New Year's Eve going into New Year's Day and we have the countdown and fireworks, but that gets experienced one time zone at a time. So it's like the world is sliced up into these different groups based on time zone and we experience that event over a 24-hour period. Whereas the halving block and every other block in Bitcoin is experienced in the same moment globally. So we have here an example of, of a new type of uh, way to track these moments that pass as a global consciousness, that that's what a block height is. It's literally a particular moment in time, regardless of where you are on the planet, that we can all agree upon and have a way of marking through the time chain. We can point to specific blocks and we're talking about specific moments in time. So when I say my child was born on this block height, that's more specific and also more of a consensus moment than just saying a date on the calendar. Because of course, I say that date on the calendar, I'm in West Coast, North America. Somebody who's in Australia says, no, it's not that date. It's this date because they're one day in the future, according to the, the traditional calendar. And so this actually is very interesting. This is where I started to come upon this idea of the time chain calendar is that I believe that this time chain uh, really functions like a calendar. It's a unique type of calendar. Each of these blocks is a globally experienced simultaneous moment of the entire human race. And you have much more fine grain uh, specificity in, as far as a block height versus just a day. You have on average 144 blocks each day. So it's like taking a 24-hour period and finding 144 unique moments within that time frame and that's how much more specific you can be. And so in a lot of ways, this is really uh, an incredible new system of marking time. Now, you also mentioned, can we meet at a specific block? And anyone who was watching for the halving had had this experience of, well, we don't know exactly when this block is coming, but we have a general idea. And of course, as time as as we get closer to that block, it becomes easier to estimate. Uh, people who were planning parties, for instance, for the having, who had to plan it six months in advance, they have a much harder task knowing what day that's going to happen on. So it's there's some interesting topics there around the calendar and how blocks relate to this timekeeping aspect of humans. That's interesting because, like, it's it's for me like you cannot predict exactly when this halving will be like you have to look a little bit in the future and there were some debates oh will it be on the 21st of april will it be the 19th of april and all those debates uh and it was on different days for for different people um and but when we only have the time chain then there are no debates about that 
right? It's, it's like it, it's just it's it's just a time change then, uh, or is it, it's like when we actually it's like there's this this thing like before Jesus Christ and after Jesus Christ with the the calendar, um, and I never went really deep in the rabbit hole of the time chain, uh, but I could imagine um, when we have a thing that we all of the sudden can agree on. And I know it because I have uh, uh, an everyday podcast where I meet with so many different people um, from all over the world. Like there's Australia in there, there's America in there, there's India in there, there's Europe in there. So this, this, this time zone thing is a real mess. And then you send the time zone, oh, but it's Australian time. In Australia, there's also three or four different time zones. Um, so you really have to get like specific. And yeah, technologies like Google Calendar take a lot of the heavy lifting. You just like send out the link and they can book it and it's shown correctly in their calendar and it's shown correctly in our calendar. Um, but there's something magical to having something global something unifying because if i say like oh i'm born at this day at this time this is only true if i'm staying in my time zone if i'm moving my time zone just a little bit i have to correct myself i have to like oh no i'm i'm actually born at this one i have to give extra context to our timing system yes it, it's for my it's it's fascinating for me that um, uh, we we had a system that we have to do so many context things and also like daylight savings time and all those interesting things. Then we're like, oh, how do we uh, define then when when let's make the, the switch like there's actually time chain. Uh, how do we then uh, define a day or something like that? How do we have an, then a, a thing that's that's above like a, a second layer to the time chain where we then yeah. have it in our language like oh we meet at the morning of that block or whatever yeah i mean what what's interesting is the traditional time-based systems are all establishing a system of measuring uh the the heavenly bodies and movements you know a day is the earth rotating once relative to the sun and then a year is the earth orbiting once around the sun so we have here these cycles that are repeating and a traditional calendar is a way of trying to measure that and then predict into the future based on that system of measuring What's really interesting to me, I went down a calendar rabbit hole um, in the last couple of years, and I I learned about how many times the calendar system has changed. We take for granted the days of the week, um, how many days are in each month, and how many months are in a year, but that's not been the same throughout history. It's changed many times, and it's because, well, as soon as humans have come up with a system of measuring it, and then they cast it forward... And now they're looking at their system and looking at the actual sun and the earth and its actual movements and saying, oops, we're off. <laughs> the calendar is not measuring it correctly. And that's where we end up with kind of this goofy system we have today. It's just been tinkered with and adjusted. Guarantee you, if we, you know, continue existing on this planet, 100, 200, 1,000 years in the future, we'll probably have an adjustment still. It'll be different again from the current system of months and uh, uh, days and, and, and this measurement. And, you know, as you start getting down the fine grain measurement of the time zones and you need daylight savings changes and all these sort of funny quirks in order to make that system work. Now with, with Bitcoin, with the time chain, it's, it's fascinating to me that there's a, there's a paradox depending which direction you're looking. So, you know, I have a little good morning message on time chain calendar. Every morning there's a little button that says GM. And if you click it, it gives you a little good morning message. Uh, there's about 30 or so messages and it randomly picks one each day. And those will change over time. But one of the messages I say there is I say, good morning, unpredictable future. 
good morning, immutable past. And this is the nature of the time chain. The past is immutable. We know exactly which moment every block has occurred. And the sequence of those moments is unchangeable. But the next block, it is uncertain. We don't know exactly when it's coming. It could come in one second. It could take two hours or more. There's this deterministic, random nature to when the blocks come. And this is part of the design of the system. So it really is fundamentally a very different timing system if we look at it and we compare it to a calendar. Um, because of that nature, in the future is unknown. Even though, you know, one of my favorite things Der Gigi said is he said the, the, the proper guess for when's in the next block is coming, it's always 10 minutes. It doesn't matter if it's been one second or one hour since the previous block. The next block, if you have to guess when it is, the best guess is 10 minutes. It's a, it's a funny thing. It starts getting into statistics and probability and, you know, these kinds of philosophies of how to look at things. But it, ultimately, for, the, for the, the, the way for the average person to just wrap their head around it is it's a random and unpredictable going forward. We, we know that the system suggests and wants and targets 10-minute block time. And based on that, we predict into the future. But of course, according to when the blocks happen and get added to the chain, looking backwards, you can, you know, continue to kind of update that. And so whenever I look at a block right now on time chain calendar, it's 24 minutes since the last block. So I could say, yeah, the next block's coming any second now. It's late. Or I could say, yeah, well, probably it's going to be somewhere about 10 minutes from now. Just it's it's a funny thing. It, it kind of challenges our our desire as a human to want everything to be predictable, to want everything to be even. Um, yeah. I think there's uh, some very interesting thoughts there. Is it similar to, like from a technical and, and from a statistical standpoint, is it similar to f uh, having dices? Like when you, for example, I, I when I dice from, it's like one to six is the possibilities, I dice it and I dice 10 times in a row. And 10 times in a row, it was always one or two. The probability is the same at the eleventh one uh, for one, two, three, four, five, six to occur. Even though I my my brain is like, if there's only one and two, then like there's a very high probability that there might now come a three, four, five, or six. Yep. But every dice is a new one. Every dice is is a new game. Is that the similar mechanics for for new block? Exactly. So as soon as a block is added to the chain, all of the miners are mining on the next block. Well, at least they should be, because if they're still mining on the previous block, they're going to be disappointed if they get lucky and hit. Um, so yeah, what's happening as soon as a new block comes, and everyone's node is notified and made aware of that new block and they're in consensus all the people trying to mine the next block must be mining on top of that most recent block and the whole competition starts again and it's entirely random it could take one second and somebody could find the block it could take two hours or more for somebody to find the block and no one knows and this is a really important thing i mean this is very intentional design by satoshi about how the system should work because this comes to the fairness of Bitcoin. Like the system cannot be perceived as fair unless we don't know who the next block is going to be mined by. That's important because the blocks, every single block has two major functions that it does. One is it confirms transactions. It adds transactions to the chain. We've added some new changes in where the UTXOs are and the state of where all the UTXOs is updated. That's one thing it does. But the other important things it does is a new block issues new Bitcoin supply. Right now, we have 3.125 Bitcoin per block. And every time there's a new block, we just hit a new block while I was speaking that sentence. Uh, we, we, so 3.125 more Bitcoin exists just now than when I started that sentence. Um, so that's the other thing is that we don't know who the next 
uh, new Bitcoin will be issued to. This last block was just mined by Foundry USA, but uh, we don't we didn't know that was going to be mined. By them. And it's important that we don't know for sure who it's going to be mined by. And so this is a very important aspect of Bitcoin: this randomness, this deterministic nature of who is going to get the next block. And that's the importance of Bitcoin mining. Even if anyone's just interested in Bitcoin or you just hodl a little bit of Bitcoin, if you don't mine, or you don't really understand mining, it's important to know that the mining is a really critical part of Bitcoin's system being fair. And it, it also is uh, very important to the security. But um, yeah, in the context of the time chain, that's that's what's happening here is the next block is... Uh, uncertain. Although, if you had to bet, you'd say ten minutes. Um, will that be more predictable in like twenty years when the mining uh, infrastructure is is just bigger and and will Bitcoin then be more predictable in in times of like in 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 order like it will always be kind of the same. And like the, this 10 minutes thing will be way more predictable. It will not be two hours. It, it's it's big news if it's like 13 minutes or 15 minutes. No, no. I, I think that we're always going to have this randomness. And so you're always going to have blocks that happen super fast and other blocks that take a very long time. What is possible to be more predictable about, and actually it's a problem with Bitcoin, is if we know who's going to win the next block. I mentioned Foundry won the last block as we were speaking, and it's a problem if we can predict, hey, Foundry or Ant Pool or one of these big pools is going to win every block. That's a problem. We just hit another block, just as I was speaking there. I'm watching the time chain calendar as we're talking. Hey, look at that. Mind by Ant Pool. That's a little bit spooky. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, th this points to problems with centralization in mining. Um, that's the only thing that we that we're going to, unfortunately, if mining continues to centralize, we will be more predictable regarding the blocks as we will at some point say, you know, uh, most of the blocks are going to be mined by this small handful of miners. And that's, that's a problem in, in Bitcoin as far as centralization, uh, long term, anyone who loves Bitcoin and cares about it wants to see less centralization and, and more diverse group of miners competing over the blocks. But that's a whole other topic. <laughs> but do you see it as uh, a solvable sol solvable problem that because it's like there's two there there are a lot of arguments to it. First of all, like I'm really glad that uh, China fought against mining in twenty twenty one, I think it was. Uh, so there is not as much mining a hash rate now in China than it was before, a lot less. I think now it's like 10, 20% maybe. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Nobody can know the exact numbers, but uh, those are the guesses. Um, and before I saw numbers up to like 70%. Uh, I don't know how exactly and how uh, good the numbers were, but in kind of a sense, it is way more decentralized, but the mining pools then centralized the uh, the system again and yeah we, we should not go too deep in into that because it's a whole whole not a podcast in itself but do you see it as a solvable problem uh or is it a problem when mining pools are very centralized but nodes are very decentralized still and the miners itself the physical miners are a uh, very decentralized all over the world yeah i mean it, it is a problem this is a, at a high level it, it's a problem as far as you know, those two important things that I said every block achieves. Uh, one is who is the new Bitcoin going to be distributed to, right? So every block 3.125 Bitcoin, uh, who does that go to? If you have fewer people who are actually submitting the blocks, then you have fewer people in control of that new supply. You know, the assumption is as people who are mining with a pool are going to get a piece of that but you know as it turns out the the pools especially the large ones are incredibly opaque about how they divide up that bitcoin and um so there's there's a lot that's sort of 
um, problematic about that at, if you go into a future where there's even fewer of those pools um, that are controlling the vast majority of the, the block rewards. And then the other thing is the other important thing that every block does is it confirms transactions and the, the winning miner gets to choose which transactions to put into that block. So of course there, that's another problem is that if you have fewer pools, you have fewer people deciding which transactions are going to get added to this time chain. And so as you have fewer people choosing which transaction comes in, there's more possibility for problems around uh, regulations that come in in different jurisdictions that maybe say, we demand that you don't put these transactions in, or we demand that you put these ones in instead. Um, you know, a lot of miners left China, but there's a lot of miners now in the United States. And depending on uh, what the intentions of regulators are, um, a lot of these large scale miners uh, are susceptible to political influence and, and actual legal influence and now you have a larger percentage of the block's mind that could potentially be, you know, interfered with on a regulatory or legal level. Um, so they get, it starts getting problematic. There's there's a lot of problems with centralization in mining, um, and it is a whole other sort of rabbit hole to go down. But yeah, we want we want basically more mining pools. We want more people. Um, determining what transactions are going to go into the blocks and more different possible recipients for those blocks. But it's also a very good point because whenever I watch um, Bitcoin versus XYZ uh, debate, the arguments that come up in those debates against Bitcoin are so weak. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always thinking like there can be some at least good arguments to, like for example like always i'm always thinking that the the bitcoiners who hold a lot of bitcoin in in terms of their net worth um they are the most critical people against bitcoin usually like they they are the best critics of of bitcoin the bitcoiners itself they which hold a high percentage of their net worth in bitcoin and those who don't obviously don't because they didn't do their homework so this is an interesting point because this is an alleged argument and it's it's something that is um uh explainable and uh it's 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 one concern or one question that we have uh, around bitcoin uh i i don't fear it uh i, I still think it's just like the, the best thing ever uh but it could run into a problem and we have to be aware of that and, and that's what's so great about uh, actual Bitcoiners who actually did the homework, they they are not closing their eyes. Like I often I hear that, oh Bitcoiners, you are you're so closed minded or you are like not open to news. No, we, like Bitcoiners are the actual ones that, that are the open ones that actually look critical at Bitcoin. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, and it, and I think that you'll see that because Bitcoiners understand Bitcoin better than people outside of Bitcoin and they do care deeply about it, maybe because they're so heavily invested, they they should care about it. Um, but the point is, is that uh, you, you want to actually learn how these things work. And then you find out that uh, the issues are more nuanced. Um, there are concerns, there are problems, but Bitcoin has had challenges from day one. And that's what it does. That's why we, we have the mascot of the honey badger, because... Bitcoin is uh, very resilient, anti-fragile, and it and it does uh, evolve. And over time, it it clearly overcomes the challenges that come its way. Uh, it's it's not perfect, but it absolutely um, that has these sort of game theoretical uh, uh, sort of characteristics where when you get to a certain problem sometimes the game theory just provides a solution so in the case of you know china uh, pushed hard against mining and then a lot of mining popped up in in other jurisdictions as a result of that and i think that's going to continue to happen um i think we do have to keep these conversations going though people do need to be aware bitcoin is not perfect and it's going to need 
people championing the right things and uh, continuing to build and continuing to uh, create solutions where there are these problems. And it's it, it, it's great uh, to to be in that community because they are there's like first of all like when you say uh, stupid stuff and you say something that is just uh, BS you actually got, get called out like um, I said that I think two times or three times already in the podcast I came into Bitcoin I was already all in in Bitcoin but I didn't understand Bitcoin to its fullest potential I think nobody ever does but um, I really was far away from understanding the freedom go up technology from Bitcoin. And I came into Bitcoin Twitter 2023 and I started to interact with just Bitcoin on, on Twitter. And uh, a lot of the times this toxic behavior of, of Bitcoiners, as, as some call it, I, I don't call it toxic. I mean, some are toxic, but most is not toxic. Um, it actually... Um, let me do question a lot of things and actually guided me to uh, do the actual Bitcoiner, to being an actual Bitcoiner. I, there's no such a thing as an actual Bitcoiner, but to, to actually understand um, what Bitcoin is, to actually understand the freedom go up technology, the censorship resistance, and why Bitcoin is so important outside of, oh, wow, I get wealthy. <laughs> so, which, which is an important marketing tool. Uh, but the, the aspect of it being a freedom technology uh, and also really interest, uh, important in terms of, of privacy, and we can talk about that, especially as, as you're also anonymous here uh, on the podcast today, um, that's what, what Bitcoin Twitter kind of guided me towards. Uh, and I love that. I love that Bitcoin Twitter was not like, Ah, oh, yeah. Let's let's let them talk. No, they, they they I came in and they said th they are things and they were direct and they were honest and they were uh, shooting uh, and I love that. Some some people say, oh no, it's it's um, uh, it's it's a turn off for for newbies and enormous. And I agree. Yeah, if if you come <laughs> only Bitcoin Twitter and you you're not heavily invested in Bitcoin uh, or you're not uh, you, you might be turned off by the Bitcoin Twitter community. Uh, but uh, I like it that way. Uh, I like that Bitcoin Twitter is like that, or Bitcoin X, uh, if we call it like that. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to have an open mind. You have to be intellectually honest, at least as far as if you have a certain idea and somebody refutes that idea or pushes back and gives you the, maybe the correction. Um, it, it's human nature sometimes to get defensive and argue or turn away and run away from that. But I think this runs into something else that we see all the time in society today, which is the truth hurts, you know, and because we're living in this post truth world, if you build up too much of a sense of comfort because of false information, and then you're confronted with something real, something true. It could actually be very painful. Uh, so that's that's the challenge. And I think this is one of the most powerful things about Bitcoin is that as you learn more about Bitcoin, you, you are exposed to more truths. You learn truth about the legacy money system. You learn truth about banking and how really the strings of power are pulled in the world. And that could be a very painful thing for people because I know myself, Growing up in America, as a, I remember being a little boy and learning these stories and mythology about my country and about it's about freedom and it's about equality and it's about, uh, you know, justice. And you have this sort of mythology that you learn about the place you live. And then as you grow up as an adult, you're like having this experience. Why? Why is this so different than what I thought it would be? Why is this so difficult? Life can feel um, very uh, frustrating and you're bumping into the truth. You're bumping into the reality. Bitcoin just rips down the curtain. It just says, let's, let's go right to the root and see what's real and what's not real. And that is a process, I think, if you're open to it, if you're honest in your, your thinking, uh, it's this transformation. It's this whole new perspective. 
and you feel like the world has changed and you, you can't go back to seeing things the way you did before. But a lot of people, and this is human nature, a lot of people fight that. They don't want to have their worldview changed. They don't want to have the framework they see the world with to be taken apart and have to build a new framework. So they resist that a lot. And I think that's what we experience when new people come into Bitcoin. Some of them have no interest in having their ideas challenged. They don't want to know the truth. They just want to have their bias uh, reinforced. And so that's, that's the interesting experience there. It's also interesting because then we come to the discussion about proof of work because you have to do actual proof of work if you want to understand uh, Bitcoin. If, 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 if you come on a, a tweet and you get rebuttaled, you get a pushback or you get new context, the human nature is like, oh, I want to win this battle. But in order to win this battle, you have to do the proof of work. You actually have to educate yourself. Otherwise, you look foolish. Uh, but a lot of people choose to look foolish, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> but uh, you, you have to look, you have to do the proof of work uh, in order to actually engage in that. Uh, and, and, and that's something, something beautiful that we have this, this truth. We have this immutable past. And then on top of that, uh, it's, it's a fair monetary system. It's in Bitcoin to show that you are also working. It's in Bitcoin that you have to do something to get something. Like that's, it's the most, um, I don't want to call it liberal idea because I don't want to put polit politics stuff on, on top of Bitcoin, but it's, it's that proof of work mechanism that's truly, um, unique with, with, with Bitcoin and so different to this rest of the, the fiat world. Yeah, it's it's a foundational thing. I think we feel that frustration with the politics a lot because people are not uh, telling the truth and they're not doing the work. Uh, you know, for me, my, my, my project, my time chain calendar project has really been a great um, way for me to actually put my ideas into practice and and helps me to you know understand it better i i love what you were saying about you know getting pushback from bitcoiners and that's been the amazing experience when i share this uh this project with with the 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 people out there who know bitcoin better than me and they they tell me i've had many times people say hey this is not right or this piece here needs to change or you've explained this in the wrong way and it's it's a powerful next level of learning to actually build um i think that's one of the steps in the journey of going down the rabbit hole is you know you first you you kind of like try to wrap your head around this and maybe you use bitcoin you 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 do a transaction or something but it's a whole next level of things to sort of build something involved with bitcoin because it it actually puts all of these concepts to the test so that's uh, that's where my experience has really um, taken me is to dive into how to you know how to visualize all of this information and how to organize it and uh, that's my own personal kind of like challenge. <laughs> yeah, I encourage everybody um, to 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 visit. I uh, wait. I will I will put it on the screen uh, so people can see it. I will uh, quickly put it on the screen. The time chain calendar. Um, but while I do that, um, you chose to stay anonymous and we talked about it before and that's why I thought about it now. That is also, uh, for you and, uh, and challenge to stay anonymous, uh, as you go along with life, as you try to build more stuff. Um, we can talk about that, but before, why are you choosing in the first place to not reveal your identity, um, to, to stay anonymous and, and there's like a lot of. I think a lot of benefits uh, to a, a lot of things get easier when you put your identity out there, I have, especially when it go, goes to like you want to get attention to a project or something like that. Um, and I think it's a very noble thing uh, if someone is doing something and don't take their personal 
credit for that. They, they are saying, I put this out and don't want any credit because that's basically what you're doing. You don't tie your identity to the project, your true identity to your project. In that way, uh, nobody really knows who, who did that. So you're, you're taking this, this Satoshi spirit. I, I also try to do it in a podcast. Obviously, <laughs> I'm in the in picture, so I, I take credit for, to some extent. But I always say, if you have some slip from the podcast or you want to take something, don't ask me, just take it. Like I even put on YouTube, not the Creative Commons license, I put the open license or whatever it's called. So everyone is free to take whatever they want from the podcast of mine, uh, because I think that's the true spirit of, of, of Satoshi, that we are putting something out there and, and not taking it. Like there's nothing wrong with taking credits. And, and if you take something from someone else, you should credit them because they did it. Uh, but I, I like that that spirit of Satoshi a lot. So, so why did you choose uh, being anonymous? You know, it's uh, that's a great question. I I I like looking back now on on this project because this has been maybe the last year and a half, a little bit more, year and uh, seven eight months, something like that. Um, and looking back, I'm actually glad that. Uh, I've done it the way I've done it. Uh, I feel like as far as the project goes, I, I want the project to speak for itself and I don't necessarily need it to be, um, viewed in the context of me as an individual. I, I really look at Bitcoin this way that, um, Bitcoin doesn't really need any of us, but it does need but, but we do need Bitcoin. And um, that's kind of the spirit of which this, this project exists, is that I, I don't uh, feel like this project needs my you know, personal identity on it. Um, I, I, I hope that it really just speaks for itself and that it provides value to people who, who use it. I know that's what it means to me. Um, I built it originally because I wanted to see this information in a new way. And so I feel like, um, you know, the greater question of sort of staying anonymous in Bitcoin, it, it, it touches on um, this concept in a very interesting way. It's the first community I've been a part of, even though everyone hates that word. <laughs> it's useful. Uh, it's the first sort of group of people I've interacted with where um, I, it's not important, my legal name and picture of my face. I can choose at any point to start using that. Um, but it doesn't, it's not necessary that I'm able to speak with people, interact with people, exchange ideas and develop an identity based on that, that is incomplete because again, my ideas and the, I, and the things I share on social media, for example, they're not dependent on my personal identity. These are ideas. You know, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is an idea. It's one of the reasons why it can't be killed is that it exists. If something happened and the, the network stopped working in some way or was shut down, it couldn't happen. But if it did, um, the idea of Bitcoin would still be there in people's minds. And so ideas are very powerful. Ideas are very hard to kill. Um, and, and I feel like that's that's kind of um, just something that's possible um, that that's becoming increasingly important to think about to think about because we we are living in a world that uh, is trying to take our privacy away cost this technology brings with it incredible connectivity but it also steals our privacy on so many levels and so using the internet and using all this technology um, I think people have, already kind of lost the concept of trying to protect their privacy. And I feel like that's an important aspect of freedom. You know, we want freedom go up. Um, and I feel like a lot of, uh, places that people live, they're using your identity against you. I think it's just kind of something to keep in mind, you know, this, I don't know if it can ever really be solved unless you run away and you live in the woods and you don't interact with anyone and don't use the internet. But, um, if you are going to use the internet, I think it's important to be 
conscious of your privacy. There's issues of sort of safety for your family. There's issues of, you know, not having your identity stolen because that could be very costly and cause a lot of problems. And so th- these, these are the things that have just kept me attempting to keep things private if I can. And, uh, you know, again, the, the, the project itself has been wonderful for me to put forward something, share my ideas, give people some tool to use. And it doesn't require my name and my face in order to, to do that. And that's, and that's a really sort of uplifting reality that I'm discovering and I like it and I want to keep it that way if I can. So those are my thoughts. Um, I just pulled it up and actually, I, I, just when you spoke, uh, I almost wanted to interrupt you because there, has, there was a block coming. <laughs> yeah, I saw it too. I've got it up. I, I saw that the big splash when there's a when there's a block. Huh. Um, may, maybe if uh, I think um, because sometimes we had a bubble, uh, and and uh, I I felt like oh probably almost everyone's already saw the time change calendar, but probably most people. Uh, in the audience uh, don't know about it or never saw it um, I, I will put it up uh, uh, now and, and maybe you can share some some of the most important um, most important elements of it and uh, what what we can see here and what we can take away from it. Thank you, you already made it halfway through the video and I'm really really grateful to have you here Two things make this channel possible You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel and another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with like 21Bitcoin who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With code Robin you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. Yeah. Um, so this is the time chain calendar and this is located at timechaincalendar.com. It is a web application. So you're viewing it on a, on a desktop screen. Uh, it can also be viewed on a phone, any mobile browser. You just, uh, go to timechaincalendar.com and pull it up. Um, it's also functioning as a progressive web app. So you can install it. You can add it to home screen on an iOS device or select install app on Android and you get a little icon. Looks just like a, a native app and you can open it. Um, so what is this? This is essentially a visualization of Bitcoin. This is like the manifestation of what's in my head. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, used a lot of different really great tools over the years with Bitcoin that helped me learn about Bitcoin and helped me keep an eye on Bitcoin. Everyone should be familiar with the memtool.space. Uh, there's some other really powerful ones out there. I like bitfeed.live. That's one of my favorites. Um, and there, there's, there's many more. But uh, I, I use these kinds of websites in my everyday Bitcoin activities. And because I'm a web developer, this is, you know, my skill set. I, I know how to build things on the internet. Um, I, I got to a point where, you know, about a year and a half ago, I said, okay, I'm going to make my own. I kind of want to see Bitcoin in, in my own way. Um, I was really inspired by a block clock, which is a piece of hardware that's made by CoinKite. It's sort of the sort of thing that sits on your desk or sits on a shelf and it shows the block height and it updates with different information. I think of this as kind of a next evolution from a block clock. Uh, you've got the block height, the largest number on the screen there in the center of the circles. That's the current block height. And just like uh, we were discussing before, that's the moment in time, the most recent moment in time that we know about from uh from the time chain uh, and you can see uh exactly to the second when that block happened you see the little circle below the block height and it says last block five minutes 50 seconds ago then it's counting 
by the second. And if you look closely, you'll see that that little green circle is completing. It's sort of like a progress of a 10 minute cycle and it changes color uh, each time it loops past 10 minutes. So if we go beyond 10 minutes since the last block, it'll start filling in in a darker green. And if it goes beyond 20 minutes, it'll start filling in an orange and eventually red. And so we're visually displaying this idea of how long it's been since the last block. This unpredictable nature of the timing of the blocks is being visualized in that little circle in the center. And then um, going around that circle, the, there's an inner circle with all those little squares on it. And it's labeled at the top, the last 24 hours of blocks. Yeah, you're hovering over one right now. So that is a visualization of the last 24 hours of blocks, and it's constantly updated. Every time a new block is hit, it gets added to the circle at the top. And if a block falls out of the 24 hours, it will disappear on the other side. So essentially, you can see visualized here the last 24 hours of blocks. What's really interesting, Robin, I hope you can see they're not evenly spread out on that circle. It's very random. You have little groupings and gaps and so this is actually um, a really powerful visualization you may not have seen anywhere else which is what actually the distribution of the blocks looks like over 24 hours and that is constantly being updated and so at any time that you look at time chain calendar you're seeing that distribution of 24 hours of blocks and as we discussed before anywhere you are in the world you see the exact same distribution of blocks because this is uh, not tied to a specific time zone. This is based on block height and time chain. And anywhere you are in the world, you're going to see that same pattern of the distribution of blocks. So that's what that circle is. Now, outside of that is the red circle. That is tracking the blocks to the difficulty adjustment. That is, do you know how many blocks are in a difficulty adjustment, sir? No. 2016 blocks. So that is an important number in Bitcoin. And that roughly takes two weeks. If we had perfect 10-minute blocks, 2016 blocks would be exactly two weeks, 14 days. Okay? So this is the difficulty adjustment. And every time that indicator makes it all the way around to the 12 o'clock position, we have a difficulty adjustment. You'll see over on the right side, in that sidebar, there's a section labeled difficulty. And you could see the previous adjustment about four days ago was 5% decrease in difficulty. And you can see what that brought the difficulty to, 79.5 trillion hashes per block. This is in basically where the difficulty is set for mining. And uh, the difficulty went down because the average block time for that two-week period was slow. It was like 10 and a half minutes per block on average. So the system automatically made it easier to find a block, reducing the difficulty. And then in that section, just to the right of the difficulty, you see the next adjustment estimated. You could see the estimated date and the estimate amount of difficulty and what direction the difficulty is going to go based on the current pace of blocks, which is in the little section right above labeled block production. You have average block time there on the left. Uh, and that says nine minutes and 46 seconds. And that's the current pace of blocks on average during this difficulty period, during this two-week period, which is marked by that red circle. So if you look at Time Chain Calendar every day, you're going to see that red indicator moving its way around. And when it gets close to the top, it's going to start pulsing. I think it's the last 100 blocks or so. It starts kind of pulsating. And you're going to know, oh, we get a difficulty adjustment incoming. And it's at that point that the estimate is most accurate. And it's at that point that that average block time is most meaningful because that's directly what the difficulty change points to, is it looks at that average block time for that two-week period and it determines what direction and how much the difficulty is going to change. So right there already, there's some deeply important technical aspects of Bitcoin that you may not know about. You may never have really looked at the difficulty adjustment or understood what it's about. It's about this time of the blocks that we've talked so much about. So that middle circle, the, the little green circle on the inside, you see how it's turning dark green now? 
That's because it's been more than 10 minutes since a block. It's almost 11 minutes, right? So this timing of the blocks is incredibly important to Bitcoin because it, it directly links to this mechanism that we call the difficulty adjustment. Sometimes it's called the difficulty retarget. And that red circle on the interface is tracking how close we are to the next uh, difficulty adjustment. All right, so that's an important point. If you want to talk more about that, we can. Let me just continue explaining the interface. Outside of the red circle, we have this orange circle, and that is tracking the blocks to the next halving. And you can see we have just less than 200,000 blocks to go. The halving happens in 210,000 blocks, and that's roughly four years. If we had perfect 10-minute blocks, 210,000 blocks would take four years. And that is the halving cycle, and we just completed a halving cycle just back in April. And the halving changes the subsidy, which is the amount of new Bitcoin that's issued with each block, by cutting it in half. Now, I want you to grab that slider at the bottom. You did this once before. And just move it back, and you can see the halving going back, and you see the big number in the middle rolling back that's showing you the block height. And you can see the subsidy change right when you go past the top. You see on the left corner, there's the subsidy. It goes 6.25, and then now it's 12.5. So you can see the, the amount of subsidy changing. Now there's one more circle, which is on the outside, and that's the total supply. And so keep going, keep moving back. You see those little notches? You just passed one. Those are the halvings. So if you keep going, you just crossed another halving. So can you see the little notches on that outer circle? And those mark where the halvings are. So if you just play with this slider, and you can actually see, this is what my app is doing. It's visualizing the relationship between the halving cycle and the issuance supply of Bitcoin. You found an Easter egg there on Genesis block. If you let go of the slider, it'll load, it'll load the block information. If you let go, so it'll it'll load the uh, information about the block there. Um, but yeah, go go forward again, and and just note the the progress of that dark orange circle, and it hits that little notch at the bottom right when the bright orange circle hits the top. So keep going. So the bright orange circle is going to reach the having at the top, but that little dark orange circle hits the having at the bottom there. That shows you visually 50% of Bitcoin's supply was issued in the first halving. Half of the 21 million was issued in the first epoch. Now go get around again, keep going forward. And you see the supply circle hits 75%. 75% of the supply was issued by the time the next halving happens, and so on and so forth. So we have a tool here. You can use this to orange pill people. You can use this to educate about Bitcoin. That, you know, this is a very important aspect of the blocks of Bitcoin is they're issuing the supply. All of the supply of Bitcoin came from rewards issued for new blocks getting hit. This is the fairness of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was not just, Satoshi didn't just press a button and Bitcoin 21 million exists. This isn't Ethereum. We have to actually do proof of work. We have to actually find out and determine who these Bitcoins get issued to. And oh, by the way, that outer circle that shows the supply, can you see how far it is from the top? It's going to take another 100 years for that to finish. So this halving is slowing down the issuance of the Bitcoin, and you can visually see that because each of those notches is half as close to the previous one, and you're basically going to we won't be alive to see the final issuance of Bitcoin. So this is really one of the beautiful things about Bitcoin is it's not just that we don't know who it's going to be issued to. It's not just that the supply gets slowed down over time, but it's also that it happens over multiple generations. And I think that was a very important uh, design choice by Satoshi. He didn't want Bitcoin to be issued in just a year or two or 10 years even, you know, the difficulty adjustment is actually what makes that happen, right? Because if the blocks come in too fast, the difficulty gets increased, which slows down the pace of blocks. I'm going to point you to the bottom right corner of the whole site. And there's that box that's labeled time chain. And it says, since Genesis, move your mouse to the right, right there. 
9 minutes and 34 seconds. That's the average block time for the entire chain. If you take 851,281 blocks and divide by the amount of time since January 3rd, 2009, it's 9 minutes and 34 seconds. So that's constantly updated. Every time we have another block, it checks that math and it makes sure that that's showing the correct average block time for the whole chain. So, you know, just in these circles in the main interface here, there's a lot of aspects of Bitcoin's design, its technical functioning, learning the significance of the having relative to the supply, learning the significance of the difficulty adjustment relative to the pace of the blocks happening, and being able to visualize the blocks in this way. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to actually find a way to visualize these things so you could just glance at it at any time and you see where we are. It's a calendar. It's a calendar of this new time system that started 15 and a half years ago and continues every 10 minutes going into the future. This is the time chain calendar. It's beautiful. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's really cool to have it all in one one place. Um, one random question. I'm not as technically savvy it's it shows that here it's um, under ten minutes, and here it's under ten minutes. The average block time is that because the network is growing, uh, because the the difficulty adjustment is usually going up, and it has to keep up. I mean, here it's uh, it adjusted down, but uh, if if the network is growing uh, at a at a good pace, then it usually has to um, adjust. Uh, the, the difficulty up, so then the average block time is is usually probably under ten minutes. Is that yeah? Is that why it's it? So great question. First, I just want to clarify um, the bottom where it says time chain. That is a measurement of the average block time for the entire lifetime of Bitcoin. The one that's underneath block production that's further up there that shows nine minutes, 47 seconds, that's measuring the average block time just for this uh, difficulty period. So in the difficulty section below, it says four days ago, that average block time right there is just in those four days, right? We had a 5% decrease in difficulty because the blocks were above 10 minutes on average during that previous difficulty cycle. So it's just a, it's a little bit um, unintuitive at first, but hopefully people can just start thinking in terms of the, the cycle of that red circle. That, that's basically the difficulty adjustment cycle. And we measure the block time uh, in each of those cycles to determine where the difficulty goes. Now, when we talk about the average block time on the whole timeline, um, yeah, it's faster than 10 minutes. And in general, thinking forward, I think what you want to think about is, is the Bitcoin network growing? Is there more people adopting Bitcoin? More importantly, are there more people choosing to compete to win blocks? Are there more people mining? Are there more people trying to, to win that issuance? And if you're optimistic about that, if you, if you believe that Bitcoin is going to continue growing, I think you would assume that we would, on average, over a long period of time, have faster than 10 minute blocks because you're going to have more people competing to find blocks and the more hash rate on the network, the faster the blocks will come in. The, the difficulty adjustment is backward looking. It comes in and says, wow, those were fast blocks that you found in the last two weeks. Let's increase the difficulty. And for s periods of time, it will slow it down. You know, right now we're, we're after a halving and we expect after a halving some miners to give up because maybe they were barely profitable before the halving and after the halving when the block reward is cut in half they are not profitable at all and they're losing money mining and at some point they may have to decide i've got to give up i have to unplug and stop mining because i'm losing money doing this um so we do expect these things to kind of you know, ebb and flow a little bit, especially in relation to the halving and how profitable miners are. But over a long period of time, certainly over years and multiple cycles, if you believe Bitcoin's growing, if you believe that there's more people competing to try to win those blocks, you would imagine that 
the blocks would come in faster than 10 minutes on average over a long period of time. And sure enough, look at that, nine minutes, 34 seconds for 15 and a half years shows us that this thing has been growing the whole time. We've had more people trying to compete. Uh, there were times when on average, the blocks were 15 minutes in the past. There were other times when the blocks came in at seven minute average. Over a long period of time, the this, this system encourages close to 10 minutes. That's all it's trying to do with the difficulty adjustment is try to kind of compensate for, was it too fast? Was it too slow? And over time, I honestly, I think it's amazing that we are so close to 10 minutes average because of how random the blocks are coming in. They come in sometimes one, two, three, right in a row, boom, 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 just a few seconds. And it's incredible that this system is slowing it down enough, despite all of the people that have come on to, to mine and, at, and joined this competition, uh, parabolic growth of the hash rate. Despite that, we're still very close to 10 minutes. It's showing you that this system is working and that this difficulty adjustment is doing its thing. And it shows you that Bitcoin will indeed be issued over many generations into the future instead of just in a short period of time. You know, without this difficulty adjustment, with this increase in competition, all the Bitcoin would have been mined already. 21 million would be gone already if we did not have the difficulty adjustment to kind of slow it down. It's, it's amazing. And we also see right now uh, in real time, that uh, block can take longer than 10 minutes because the, uh, right now it's like 22 minutes yep. already. And we also see the nice uh, orange line that you teased before that comes after the, the dark green one. Really cool. Yeah, it's going to turn red and dark red eventually if the block takes too long. I, at some point, I'm going to add some animation to it. If it goes over an hour, it should start shaking. It should instill a little anxiety in you, you know? Um, this is the power of these sort of visualizations. I'm trying to actually help people just be aware and notice that, you know, it's going to be in about, uh, you know, 10 days or so, we're going to have the next difficulty adjustment. If you remember, look at your time chain calendar every day. If you look at it 10 days from now, you're going to notice that red circle start to pulsate to let you know the the, the change, the adjustment is about to happen. And it's going to sort of pulsate deeper and faster as it gets closer. You know, when you get to about, uh, you know, 10 blocks away, that thing's kind of, you know, really alerting you that something's happening. Which is also cool. Uh, people can actually now go to timechaincalendar.com and look what the current block height is and then compare it to this block height so they know kind of like when we actually uh, made this episode. Uh, and when it aired and everything, like it, it's it's really cool. Uh, I mean, you can also see. Um, I don't know if it's in this in the uh, in the stream also, but uh, uh, can you also see my my time there? Uh, probably it's not on the yeah. screen, right? Yeah, yeah. It says seven forty nine p.m. there. So that's the yeah. thing about the web is that if you pull up this website wherever you are in the world, it's going to be showing your date and time at the bottom. So I see a very different time uh, over here in California on my time chain calendar at the same time. Uh, it's going to show you your local time and whatever block you go to in the past, that's going to be relative to your uh, time zone, the time when you see it. So go, just go to a random block in the past, just let go, see it loads and it's showing you that was 3.40 a.m. your time and you can see in the center that's roughly six months ago. You see the details about the block. You see who lined it. Look at the block reward up, up above. See, it says subsidy 625, 6.25, and then the fees, and then the block reward was over seven. Over seven Bitcoin in that block went to Ant Pool. So, you know, now click the double arrows to go back to live, and you can see the block reward now. Just this last block was 3.2. This big difference because the subsidy went down, and also the fees are quite low right now. Let me draw your attention to that top of the sidebar there's that section that box that and you see fee rates and mempool uh green and red over on the right in the sidebar yeah so um what we have here is we have a very simple view of the current fees so you see priority rate and any time rate this is just really simple guidance if you are interested in doing a transaction pay attention to that priority rate that's the estimate of what it's going to take to get into the last block 
You can also see underneath the block height. Uh, so at the, back in the main interface, um, 851281, just below that, you see on that little details line, 4,000 transactions. And then just to the right of that, it shows a, a eight sats per V-byte was the uh, average fee in the last block. And then it shows you the range six to 289. And now you look at the current uh, fees up in the upper right, which is shows you 11. So you can see just since the last block, because it's been almost a half hour since the last block, the priority rate to get into a block has gone up. And so using this information, you can get a very good sense about maybe what kind of fee you need to put on your transaction if you really care about when it's going to get into the time chain. So if you had to transact right now and you need it to happen as soon as possible, you probably want to pay a fee of 11 or higher. If the block takes more time to get confirmed, that fee rate will go up. So depending how absolutely urgent you are, you might want to bid a much higher fee, right? If you put 20 sats per V-byte, you're probably going to get into the next block for sure. If you don't really care about how fast your transaction is going to get in, use that anytime rate. You know, you pay four or five sats per V-byte. Maybe the transaction goes in and sometime in the next hour or maybe later today. Um, and then that purge level in the fee rates, that's giving you an indication of if you pay a fee that's that low or lower, you're not even being held on to by most nodes. Most nodes are not even storing your transaction in memory. So this is very simple guidelines to give you a sense of what kind of fee you should pay if you're very urgent, priority, what kind of fee you should pay if you're not in a rush anytime. And be aware, don't put your fee at or below the purge level because that's going to really slow your transaction down. Um, so that's uh, useful information if you're transacting. Just below that, there's mempool information that shows you the quantity of transactions in the mempool, um, how many blocks that is, and that inflow amount is the currently how many, uh, how much new transactions uh, data is coming into the mempool at the moment. You'll see that number spike sometimes when there's a huge influx of new transactions coming in. But just, you know, that that box is uh, contained and displayed in that way just to show you this is the information about getting into a block. This is sort of like block space demand information, the fees, and the, and the data about what's there that you're competing with to try to get into a block. That is, that is really cool. I love it a lot. Um, it's also like, well, the, the fees are, are, are low now, so it's a good time to, to consolidate your UTX or something like that. Sure. You want to do it during that? Yeah, you notice the fee section is green. That, that's but not always the case. color changes. Yeah, the color changes. It changes to a not green if, if it goes higher than 20. And if they go above a certain threshold, it'll turn red. Uh, I, I really try to use color to help communicate things. Um, and again, this is sort of the nature of this project is it's meant to be a very functional dashboard that you just glance at and you get a good sense um, what's going on. So you might not even see the number of what the fee is, but from across the room, you could see, oh, the fees turned red. It's not a good time to transact right now. It's very expensive, um, you know, and that's the kind of thing that uh, I, I like to to focus on on this project. It's also a cool idea to like, before you make a transaction, just like quickly look at a time chain calendar and uh, then you see the, see, oh, it's green, oh, it's uh, yellow or whatever. And then you're like, oh, if it's green, I, I can do it now. Or it's red, I will wait a little bit. Yep, exactly. So now look, we just finished another loop. We're more than 30 minutes since the last block. And now that circle is starting to get filled in with a dark orange. And it gets serious after that. If we do another 10 minutes, it comes red. And, you know, it's a, like this, this thing is just trying to communicate with you. It's just trying to tell you where we are right now. And, you know, it's funny because we had this conversation about you know, the timing of the blocks and the time chain and this randomness, it's not necessarily wrong. It's not necessarily bad, but, you know, this is kind of the more nuanced way to think about Bitcoin. We say, oh, blocks are every 10 minutes, Bitcoin verifies, or every 10 minutes this happens. 
Well, it's not every 10 minutes. Look at that 24 hours of blocks. You can see how uneven it is. And right now we're experiencing more than 30 minutes since the last block. So it's, it's just one of these things where use this, uh, use this app and start developing a better okay. sense. And there it is. We hit a block. Look at that. So, um, you know, it all starts over again now. Now we're, we're starting the, the timer over and, and look at the fees all of a sudden. Okay, up in the upper right hand corner, it's eight sats per V per V byte to get into the next block priority. But look at the fees that were paid in that last block. You can see right under the big block height, it says 16 sats per V byte was the average fee in the last block. Right? Oh, another block. Do you see that? That was like one minute since the previous block. We hit another one. So, I mean, we, this is a great example. You can start to get a sense what's actually happening here. Now, look at the last block was average seven sats per V-byte to get in. So the one before that was 16, and that was because it took so long to the previous block. So timing sometimes makes the difference. If you're really urgent, you're going to have to pay higher to be sure you get in the next block. Whereas, look, if you just waited you can get into that previous block for for much less so this is uh this is all just an effort to try to wrap your head around how bitcoin works and this can be very relevant to you as an individual if you want to transact on chain you should be aware of these things you should have this stuff in front of you it's kind of like you're going to go out into the world you're going to walk out of your house or your apartment you're going to go out in the world, maybe should you look out the window and see if it's raining or not? Maybe should you check the temperature and see if you should wear a sweater or if you should be in a t-shirt? Like, it's the same kind of thing. Check it out. See what's going on in the mempool. See what the fees are like. Uh, and, and get a better sense before you broadcast your transaction so that you can be efficient and transact uh, efficiently. Not a priority even is down to six. Yep. It, I think it's uh, um, uh, we're we're all almost going over time <laughs> right now, but I it's it's a really cool topic, and I feel like um, a lot of people learned uh, in the last like 30, 40 minutes a lot about uh, the blockchain, about the time chain. Sorry, <laughs> uh, and it's 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 great. It was also a really cool example with the thirty minutes. Then we hit one. And then right afterwards, I, I don't know if it even was a minute. I think it was like around a minute or maybe even less than that. We hit a new one. Now we're waiting two minutes for that. We saw the transaction fees for that. Um, it, it's been really educational. Um, uh, thank you already for that. Uh, and uh, uh, it's 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 been already really cool. Yeah. Hey, I wanna I wanna point out one more thing, which is that um, the app is in fourteen different languages, including German. Oh, and I don't know if you've ever had a look in German. I do have to apologize. I did a big update just a week or so ago. And so there's a few English strings in there. I'm waiting for my translator to uh, make another set of updates on the labels. So we have some uh, a few English strings that still need to be translated to German. That should be updated in the next week or so. Um, but if you go to timechaincalendar.com slash DE, it's in German. So you can share it with your German speaking friends and you can do all of this stuff in German language as far as learning about Bitcoin and um, understanding these technical aspects that we've been talking about. So uh, yeah, actually you can, you can, uh, you can see most everything is in German. Uh, at this point, there's a couple things you'll see in, uh, in English that have snuck through. Um, those are the labels that need to be updated still, but it, it should be very um, should be very understandable, hopefully, um, for someone who is German speaking, maybe not as comfortable with English. Uh, and you know, really, that that's the beauty here is I, I, I'm I'm trying to get this in as many languages as possible. I have it translated into Chinese. I have it translated into uh, French and German and Italian. Spanish, Portuguese, um, and uh, yeah, there we go. So really, Arabic is another big one. Greek, 
Yeah. So it's, it's really a, um, it's a, it's a challenge. I've had actual, um, plebs help me with every translation. I've not automated anything. It's all, um, very carefully crafted, uh, translations. Um, and the, the reason is because this educational potential, this is really a, a powerful tool for someone to learn more about Bitcoin themselves or to help teach others about Bitcoin. If you go to the info section at the very top, there's a little info link. Um, there's a terminology list in there that has a lot of these terms kind of explained uh, to try to you know give better context around what's being displayed here. Um, and so you know that's just kind of part of my hope with this project is that this is going to be um, really a a useful thing for people that they're going to hopefully learn something about Bitcoin, you know, just looking at it every day. Uh, it can function like a calendar and really help you uh, see where we are in the journey and help build your conviction. I also love those resources with mempool.space with like uh, uh, what the fuck happened in 1971 yep. with the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, cool, cool resources. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. That that list is going to keep growing. You know, that list uh, right there that shows that the inspiration for Time Chain Calendar, that's like really um, an important thing. You know, all of those projects in there, the Block Clock, Clark Moody's dashboard, they, they've all really inspired me. And so I wanted to make sure people could get to all of those things. Um, there's also, you know, I mentioned in there, mental space is important because I'm actually using their uh, API uh, to provide the, the data so if you actually pulled up time chain calendar and mempool space side by side, you would see uh, the same numbers for a lot of the data points. I'm getting that data from their API. It's one of the things on my roadmap at some point, I am going to build out my own API to back this, but this project is really a uh, client side app. That's, you know, my specialty is front end web. And so uh, I built this as basically it's, it's kind of like a, a, new skin on top of mental space data so that's that's one way to kind of understand exactly what i what i've built here that's really cool and i, I mean it's 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 great that you uh do work together with mempool really cool I, I i met the guys from from there on on bitcoin prague i think last year uh, the first time all the really cool cool people there yeah absolutely legends Perfect. Then uh, let's. Wow, well, I did not expect that <laughs> that, that section takes so long, but uh, I love it a lot. Like uh, it was um, something. There were new things in there for me, mm. uh, and uh, definitely a lot of new things probably for for my audience. And I think it's important to to put this at a date knows and even almost platinum based stuff. Also in the all the libraries like i know that a video where there's like oh bitcoin 100x oh bitcoin to 10 million probably gets more clicks <laughs> um but it's Im so important to to, to get the, the fundamentals out and i feel like the the time chain calendar and mempool.space and all those all those websites are kind of a representative of those fundamentals and uh, it's like a, a an and UI for for Bitcoin for for everyone to access at any time, and it really like is easily understandable. And it's as you said, it, it could be even a potential um, a orange pilling tool. Uh, and, and and people see it, it's like there's something happening with a new block, and you can like, explain how the new blocks are added and stuff like that. It's it's really cool. If, uh, thank you just for uh, thank you for building that. It's it's, it's really nice. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I find it's important to say um, in talking with people, it's like so many people are just staring at a price chart. That's all they look at. And they think that's Bitcoin. But that's actually outside of Bitcoin. Bitcoin has no price. You'll notice on the time chain calendar, I don't call it price. I say it's exchange. It's it's exchange between fiat and Bitcoin. But that's, that's the only place that you see that um, information the, the whole rest of the interface, it's all about the actual thing. That's what people are buying and selling is Bitcoin. And it is actually a real uh, technology. It's an actual protocol. And 
And there's some things to learn in order to be able to even think about it properly. And we all know that you go down that rabbit hole and that's where the real conviction comes from. Find out there is freedom go up and there is these other aspects that actually are so important. Without those things, nobody would care. And so I, I think it's, it's so important to help um, see that. And, and, and that's, that's hopefully what Time Chain Calendar is doing. I, I really appreciate you having me on. I, I, I'm so grateful for um, being able to share this. And I know that uh, there's so many uh, Bitcoiners in Germany and in German language. And I'm, I'm very stoked to, uh, to have people using this. I know that the, um, there was a, a lady in uh, the German Bundestag who had the Time Chain Calendar up on her, her wall. Everybody tagged me when she did some video and it was up there. And it's, you know, to me, that's just so exciting. It lifts my spirits to know that, um, this is being actually viewed, uh, by people all over the world. It's, it's exciting. Yes, she's a, a member of the German parliament, uh, Ho uh, Joanna Kota, mm -hmm. I think it's her name. And uh, yeah, that the picture you sent me to, to me uh, right before we started the podcast, it, it is really cool that uh, she actually did go down the rabbit hole. Uh, and I had the honor to be with her in a space or two already and interview her a little bit. And yeah, it's 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 been great uh, talk, talking with her and 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 seeing where where she says like it's it's in, it's cool to to see also the the politics a little bit coming now into Bitcoin and and uh, people in politics noticing the they kind of have to adopt it because the voters adopted it and, and now they're kind of forced to it. Like that's the whole thing with Trump. Trump Trump doesn't talk about Bitcoin right now because he think it's cool. At least I think so. He, he talks about it because uh, he thinks it brings him him votes. If he's an actual Bitcoin or not, like I have no clue. I was not in America. I have no clue about American politics. <laughs> I also don't care. Um, but uh, interesting is that he talks about it and that he um, has the need to talk about it right now because Bitcoin is so powerful. And also with Joanna Kota from the German Parliament, it's it's great and. Uh, uh, it's it's even better if if uh, she's posting a picture where it's on the wall. Imagine what what uh, what wave it would get if if Donald Trump did the same thing as Joanna Kota and putting <laughs> like a picture in the front TV and there's the time chain calendar. Yeah, no, I mean, I I just I just hope that um, she's like learning about Bitcoin on a deeper level, and that's the potential. Um, I hope for time chain calendars, it's like you can keep an eye on Bitcoin itself and you can actually understand it deeper than just what's the price today, you know? Um, before we come to our end routine, I have one uh, last question for you. Um, and I'm asking specifically not for, <laughs> for the price. What are your wildest future prediction for Bitcoin? Well, I got to say, um, I, I know there's going to be a lot of challenges and I don't think it's a straight line. I think it's a roller coaster ride, but I do believe that there is the potential for change in how society functions in regards to money, that if this monetary system in Bitcoin can be adopted uh, and infiltrate all these different layers of society because I, that's what we see. We see it going from individuals to businesses and corporations, now nation states. Um, at some point, uh, the incentives that Bitcoin encourages can actually lead us to new ways of structuring society in new ways of interacting that maybe if we don't have the same um, ability to corrupt that the fiat money system provides maybe it provides an anchor that allows um, society to build in a in a much more uh, strong and um, uncorruptible way i think it's a it's a bit uh, optimistic it's a bit hopeful 
I hope it's not naive, but I do believe there's some potential for that. I think if you asked me that question a few years ago, I said, it's for sure, it's going to totally change everything. Now I have a little bit more of a kind of nuanced view that it's maybe just the first step and many more steps are required. But I think it really does have that potential to to help change the way people uh, organize and, and interact with one another in a, in a positive way. I think that's, uh, I see it more and more that uh, Bitcoiners are um, seeing Bitcoin in a realistic con context more and more. I, I, I see what you described like uh, a year ago and like, and it's it's it likes Bitcoin is kind of growing up uh, and Bitcoin airs also growing up with with Bitcoin and I think that's 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 something good and, and beautiful actually. Um, perfect. And uh, our end routine consists as, uh, uh, from two questions. The first question is always the same one, even though I changed it a little bit uh, a, a few episodes back. Um, and the last question is then uh, from the previous guest. So the, the question is always the same is for you, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and money? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I just hope that, um, people take a look at time chain calendar. That's really, that's really it. I, 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 I view this project as my way of sharing all of my views um about about bitcoin um outside of bitcoin um i think i i'm i'm personally just on a, a sort of self improvement phase of my life um if you talk to me uh, it's like on on twitter uh you're likely to hear me talking about carnivore diet and fitness and health and family i mean these are these are things that i have really um started to focus on in my personal life and so i don't know if that rubs off on anyone i think it's really kind of the amazing thing about bitcoin is that it serves as a catalyst to form this perspective where you're seeking truth and you're seeking the better ways of doing everything and you're you're paying attention to proof of work and so those concepts apply to everything outside of bitcoin as well and so maybe that's all i i i hope that people do the best thing to become the best version of themselves be healthier pay attention take just as much interest in your food as what you're taking in your money and take just as much interest in building a family and uh you know that's the best thing you can do for your future have kids and raise them well and build a family i mean this is the the that's the basic building blocks of humanity so you know i i guess i would say uh you know take those take that truth seeking mentality from bitcoin and apply it to everything else meaningful in your life that's beautiful and by the way, we are already the the second longest episode. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, but we will not beat the, the 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 longest episode. It was over two hours, unfortunately. Oh wow! Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, before we come, uh, we have the last uh, question the 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 question from the previous guest. So we have this Andrew team where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, and your question is, what would you do if we did not have Bitcoin? Oh boy. Um, I mean, I think my, my worldview would still be very clouded. Um, I probably would be trying to stack gold and silver, maybe <laughs> I, I might be, um, I might be, you know, looking at some of this self-improvement stuff and, you know, trying to find sovereignty, but I, I have a hard time imagining I would see it the same way without Bitcoin because Bitcoin has really given me my perspective on sovereignty that's in a, in a whole new way. You know, before I found Bitcoin, I, I was interested in sort of prepping 
and kind of thinking about, you know, what happens if society goes the wrong way? How do I survive? So I, I guess that that's where my head would be as kind of still um, trying to figure out uh, how to how to provide some certainty in an uncertain world. Um, that's that's I think what happens in adulthood, anyways. I think as we all grow older, that's what you focus on. How do I provide some certainty for myself, for my family? Um, so maybe that's where my focus would be, but a whole nother level of clarity comes from Bitcoin. It, it really does help you kind of weed through the fog and the noise and find the signal and focus there. I love it a lot. Perfect. Then before I let you go, um, where can people find you outside of time chain calendar? Is there some way to, to contact you? Yeah, so timechaincalendar.com is is a project. Uh, if you just go there, uh, I'm happy. Uh, but if you wanted to find me on social, I'm on the Twitter and the X. There's a official uh, account for the project, which is at timechaincal, C-A-L. Um, that's the handle for the main official Time Chain Calendar Twitter account. Um, I'm also on Nostr. Uh, if you go to Noster and you look up TC at timechaincalendar.com, you'll find me. And uh, that Noster account is mostly Time Chain Calendar stuff, although some of my personal opinions end up slipping through. It's a bit of a fusion of personal and, and project accounts. Um, but yeah, that's that's how you can find me. And um, uh, yeah, let me know if you... Try to you know tag me or 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 try to DM me if you have a question. I'm I'm pretty interactive there. Perfect. Then thank you TC for joining us today. Thank you also for everyone listening uh, and watching for joining us today. I'll be back tomorrow as always with another episode. Bye bye.